Hello my friends and welcome to this video where I, Gary McGowan, I'm going to be discussing the heart. I'm going to be discussing it with an emphasis on exercise and in particular what we're going to discuss are some of the adaptations that lend themselves to better cardiac function and thus better exercise performance and that then leads us to a discussion of some of the differences between the untrained and the trained individual when it comes to their cardiac function. So first things first, it's important to reverse a little bit, take a step back and understand that the heart obviously has a very important role in exercise. One of its most important roles in exercise is the ability to deliver blood quickly and promptly at high volumes around the body so as to maintain oxygenation in working muscles and of course related organs. Now along with that it also plays the important role of being able to deliver deoxygenated blood with its waste products such as carbon dioxide to the lungs so that it can be reoxygenated and also so that we can get rid of that carbon dioxide so that the blood that comes back to the left side of the heart that we're pumping out to the rest of the body has what it needs to be useful to those working muscles. So there's a lot going on in terms of what the heart has to do and the most difficult thing that you can understand in, in your own work and in your own life is that the heart has to be able to do its job very, very quickly and increasingly quickly as exercise intensity increases. So let's take a step back and look at some of the basics of cardiac function to start with. So let's start here by orienting ourselves on this basic illustration of the heart, okay? So what we've got here are the chambers of the heart. Okay, it's obviously a very basic diagram, but that's almost most helpful for understanding. So this is the left side of the heart. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle, which as you can see is the most muscular portion of the heart because that's gonna be sending blood out to the rest of the body via the aorta, okay, so that's the aorta. Blood from the left ventricle is gonna go out of the aorta and go to the peripheral muscles, peripheral organs, the brain, etc. So on the other side of the heart, then we've got the deoxygenated side. So we've got our right atrium here. Then we've got our tricuspid valve. I should have said that as well. That's the mitral valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Got our tricuspid valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And then out of here, we've got the pulmonary artery. So that's going to the lungs. So deoxygenated blood is leaving the right side of the heart to go to the lungs where it will be oxygenated and will then return uh, to the left side of the heart via the pulmonary veins, okay? So they're not really in this location, but I'm just gonna put them here for now. So that blood from the lungs is gonna come back in there oxygenated. And this blood that gets to the right side of the heart is gonna come via the uh, vena cava. So there's a superior and an inferior portion, but for today, look, we'll just say vena cava, okay? So we've got our deoxygenated blood coming back from the rest of the body there into the right side of the heart. So fundamentally what I want you to focus on here is that we've got our two chambers on each side, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. This is the deoxygenated side on the right. This is the deoxygenated side on the left. As we go out of the left side of the heart, we're going into the aorta and that's what brings our blood to the rest of the body. Okay, so I'm just gonna say body plus O2, so that's our oxygenated blood. You don't need to focus on the diagram too much because I'm gonna be illustrating what I'm talking about. So as we come out of the left side of the heart, what we want for exercise performance is to be able to maximize the amount of blood that comes out of the left side of the heart per beat, okay? So there's two ways that we can increase the amount of blood that gets around the body. And that starts with understanding what's referred to as cardiac output. So cardiac output, CO, equals heart rate, times stroke volume, okay? Heart rate is beat, beats per minute, okay? So for example, 150 beats per minute might be considered to be moderate intensity exercise. And then stroke volume is measured in milliliters, okay? And then obviously we've got milliliters per minute, which would be your cardiac output. Now, in terms of stroke volume, this is something we need to zoom in on for a moment. So stroke volume is effectively the amount of blood that's gonna come out of each heartbeat, okay? So each time that heart contracts, how much blood are we getting out? And that's equal to end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that's in the chamber prior to 
contracting. So it's at the end of diastole, which is the filling phase. So when you read a, when you read a blood pressure chart, for example, you see two numbers. You see systolic over diastolic. Systolic refers to the pressure at the contraction point. Diastolic refers to the pressure at the filling point, okay? So end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that we have in the heart at the end of the filling phase, okay? So if we take this chamber now and we just move it over here on its own, that's gonna be your end diastolic volume when it's all filled up, okay? So that's the amount of blood we've got in there and for now let's just say that's 150 milliliters. And systolic volume is gonna be similar but in this case, we've taken all the blood out because it's contracted. Okay, so let's just say we have 50 milliliters left. So in that case here, what we've got is a little bit of blood left over. So there's always gonna be a little bit left over. You're not gonna get it all out. But an efficient heart is gonna be able to maximize the amount of blood that we're getting out per beat. So here what we've got end diastolic volume, that's the full heart and systolic volume is going to be basically your empty heart where it's contracted, it's squeezed everything out. And the difference between the two then is what's gonna give us our stroke volume. So stroke volume is gonna be the difference between end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, which in this case is gonna be 100 milliliters, okay? So if we have a stroke volume of 100 milliliters and a heart rate of 100 beats per minute, then we're gonna have a cardiac output of 10 liters per minute, okay, so 10 liters per minute. As we increase our heart rate, we can continue to increase that cardiac output. But here's the catch, and here's why this is an important discussion. If you continue to increase your heart rate and you're trying to contract it faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, it doesn't have enough time to relax, and it's gonna be difficult to refill this portion, the end diastolic volume, each time. If I've got a dumbbell and you ask me to do 10 reps in 10 seconds, okay, I'm gonna go one, two, three, okay, I can, I can manage that. If you ask me to do 10 reps in five seconds, I'm not gonna be able to move the entire distance from the top to the bottom and get it back up again in that short period of time. Now you ask me to do 10 reps in three seconds, 10 reps in one second, it's not possible. What I'm gonna end up doing is this, okay, I'm gonna be like just doing these kind of reps. They're not appropriate full range of motion reps. And that's exactly what happens in the heart. So when your heart starts to beat extremely fast, it's not able to relax appropriately to get back to this point, and it mightn't even be contracting appropriately to get back to that point. So what you end up doing is compromising stroke volume for the sake of increasing heart rate, all right? So what we want in an efficient heart that's gonna be appropriate for high level of exercise performance is that we're able to maximize heart rate without trading off our stroke volume. And that is what we actually see in athletes, okay? So there's a couple of different variables that go into this. Number one is increasing venous return. So we've got this blood that we said that comes back from the body via the vena cava, and then it goes into the right side of the heart. So I focused on the left side of the heart so far, but the right side of the heart is also very important. What we need is that, firstly, we've got good blood uh, venous return into the right side of the heart. We then need the right side of the heart to be effective at relaxing and contracting because that's doing its job as well. That needs to be able to relax, to fill, and then to contract to get that blood into the left side of the heart. Then when we get to the left side of the heart, once again what we need is appropriate eccentric contraction, the ability to fill that heart up and then for it to, sque to squeeze out. So we've got the venous return, Okay, that's an important component. We've got the capacity for the ventricles to relax. That's an important component. And then we need the contractility of that heart to be in a good place. We need the muscle to be functioning well. We need the input of both hormones and the nervous system to be functioning well. And for example, if someone has had a previous disease that has rendered them with uh, scar tissue in the heart, for example, if you've had a previous myocardial infarction, a previous heart attack, or you've got ongoing heart failure, or another disease like cardiac amyloidosis, or any anything else, what you can end up with is heart tissue that's just of a little bit poorer quality that won't have the same capacity to uh, relax, to stretch, and then to contract again. So we need all of these things to be in place. We need to be able to get the blood back, we need to be able to relax the muscles, we need to be able to contract the muscles, and then there's even more to it. So we also need to be in a place where what's pushing back against us is not excessive. So for example, so we've got the aorta here, and here we've got the aortic valve, and there's a condition referred to as aortic stenosis, where that valve effectively 
narrows and constricts and is going to be pushing back against the heart and limiting our capacity to get blood flow out. And that's just an extreme example of where we would have greater pushback that would limit our ability to get that blood flow out. So overall, what we need is blood returning, heart relaxing, heart contracting appropriately, and then basically a clear path ahead of us so that we can pump that blood out to the rest of the body. And we can zoom in on each of these individual components in future videos, but what I want you to know for now is that these variables are not fixed. They do change, they do improve in athletes. And one of the most fascinating things from my perspective is that athletes are actually able to continue increasing that heart rate without the same trade-off in their stroke volume. So there does come a point for both untrained and trained individuals where stroke volume will begin to become compromised and we'll have a reduced ejection fraction, which is the ratio between these two at higher heart rates. What you see in trained athletes is that the plateau is much higher than untrained individuals. So effectively what they're able to do is keep increasing that heart rate while maintaining their stroke volume and thus achieving a much higher overall cardiac output. So all of that is related to all those variables that we discussed. So hopefully you found this again an interesting insight into some of the variables that might be at play between athletes and untrained individuals and stay tuned for future videos where we will delve further into these topics and also give you some practical take-home points in terms of what this means for your training.